I'm Lorraine Weber. I'm the executive director of the Detroit Metropolitan Bar Association. And um, my law school career was in Boston College uh, longer ago than I like to, <laughs> to remember. I believe it was 1977. So I'm 31 years a lawyer at this time. Um, my background has been predominantly in administration um, in a variety of ways. I was the juvenile court, probate and juvenile court administrator for Wayne County Probate Court here in Detroit for 12 years. I um, managed the Michigan Supreme Court task forces on race, gender, and ethnic issues in the courts. Uh, I was also on the juvenile court bench as a sitting referee for seven years. Uh, worked for the State Bar of Michigan in their diversity initiatives as special advisor to their Open Justice Commission, and now have moved to executive director of the State Bar or of the Detroit Bar. So all of those have kind of led me to an unusual way of practicing law. I only practiced law a very short period of time at the beginning of my career with my father. Uh, for about a year and a half. And other than that, I have, I have followed alternative legal uh, areas, and, and, uh, but been involved in courts and, and lawyers for my entire career. I, uh, I had the opportunity to work with one of Michigan Supreme Court justices in one of the task forces that I was involved in, and, and um, and she is in a situation where for, you know, as happens often, you're kind of in the minority all the time. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that, you know, the four to three decisions keep coming down and you're always in the three. And, and I watched her just remain un, unbound by that and, and, and willing to keep kind of stepping forward and, and putting her, you know, her opinion forward and, and, and not getting swept away by the tide and again not losing her ability to, to, to kind of, you know, see herself as mattering. And, um, and I learned a lot from, from her as well in, in the process because we, we went through some challenging times and so it was, it was a lesson that I needed to see that, that um, you don't always judge what you do by whether or not it's successful at the outcome. It's about whether or not you're doing it because it's the thing to do. Uh, so that had, has helped me a lot because you don't always get the luxury of not only doing the thing to do but having it succeed when, when it comes done. We think it ought to, but that's not necessarily a done deal. You have to just keep trusting that if you keep doing it enough times, eventually, you know, the, the plant will get moved by the ant. <laughs> well, um, over now, I think 25 years ago, uh, I had the great good fortune of beginning to work with a, a wonderful uh, woman who um, was, was kind of guiding me through a very rough period of my, of, of my life. My mother had died very early. I was 27 and just graduated from law school and, and was a little lost in, in what I was doing. And I managed to find this great Jungian uh, being who, who came into my life and she um, taught me how to listen to my inner voice uh, through my dreams, through my own knowing. Uh, she showed me that that I didn't need somebody else to tell me what was true for me. I just needed to learn to listen and understand the language I was speaking. And out of that, I, I got to a place where I knew that there was this kind of void in my life, a, a place that, that success or family or all of the things that I had achieved at that time were not filling. And so I, I defined that as a spiritual of space, that I, I needed to find a way to express myself in the world that was beyond just what I was doing in it. And, uh, and so I began that exploration with her and uh, through that process was able to connect with 
the place that I experienced um, what I think of as, as creator and source and God, which is in nature. Uh, for me, that's where I feel most connected to, to the force of, of, uh, of the sacred in the world. And, um, and through that, then, I was able to find places that would teach me how to not just experience it outside of myself, but also to, to um, find traditions and earth-based practices that would help me experience it from the deepest part of me. And, uh, and that include the creation of ceremonies and the understanding of the ways in which the natural world is, is always kind of partnering me in the process of discovering who I am and, and what it is my soul's asking me to, to follow here. Because I think the place that I most found that I could express my, my spiritual practice in my profession uh, was when I was on the bench as a juvenile court referee in, in Wayne County here in Michigan, Detroit. Um, the opportunity to work in uh, an environment where arguably one sees the most difficult and the most devastating experiences happening to children and families um, is, a, is a pretty daunting one. And if you cannot find a place to hold that, that allows you to both see that you make some difference in, in their lives, but that you cannot make all the difference, <laughs> um, I, think you, I think you can lose yourself very quickly. So I was able in that arena to bring whatever practice I had, had come to from my own spiritual work to a place where I knew that I could, I could, hold, I could hold space for what was happening in my courtroom. I could also judge without judgment, which is a huge thing, without making people wrong or bad. I could allow for what I, I call the energy of ruthless compassion to be my guide. Uh, the ruthlessness to say there are consequences to things that happen in the world. And I've been elected and appointed to, to mete out those consequences. And they get to be meted out, even though they're hard sometimes and difficult and change people's lives irrevocably. But those ruthless consequences have to be tempered with heartful compassion. They have to come from a, a place, I believe, where whoever is the recipient of those consequences understands that, um, that you're holding them in a particular way, and I call that compassion. That you understand that there are reasons why they've come to this horrible place in their life. And also that you believe that they can change, that no one is irretrievable particularly not the children that I saw in my courtroom, but even more so their families and their parents. So that was my guiding kind of <laughs> mantra during that time. And I, I believe that, that it did teach me how to do that in ways that I would never have learned any place else. And it also taught me how to let go of things, to know that I, I wasn't in charge of the world that these circumstances were not within my control and that there was a small part that I could play in them. And if I played my part to the very best of my ability, then I had to leave the rest up to, to you know, the universe and, and whatever forces out there and, and to those individuals themselves to find their own way and just keep being confident they could, you know, never giving up on them.